Thank you very kindly. We have an interesting subject today, which has not received the attention that would be appropriate in the past, because things that are close at hand are not generally considered as deeply as matters of a far distant location. The American Indian is right here, and we have taken him for granted for a long time, and it is only in the last 20, 25 years, the research concerning this great culture group has received a great deal of attention. First of all, let's bear in mind that it is obvious that the American Indian did not originate here. And where he came from has become a source of great deal of research in recent times. Some believe that he is an Asiatic who came here by way of the Bering Straits migration or the Aleutian Island chain. Others believe that he came directly across from the Orient. The Chinese have records of exploration on this continent, and ancient Chinese artifacts have been found underground and excavated in the area of Mexico City. Also, there is considerable thought that perhaps the Japanese had something to do with this, because they have ex records of an extensive uh, exploration from uh, what we would term Baja California all the way down to Peru. And uh, in order that it might not be assumed that they have taken this matter lightly, the Japanese government presented to the government of Peru a statue of the first traditional emperor of Japan to bear witness to the fact that the early Japanese explorers did actually reach Peru. There are also other sides to this. We have the Atlantic side. Here we have a very large dissemination and distribution. The Seminoles in the Florida area have very clear record that they came from a land to the east, that they came across what was then a land bridge, which later disappeared. These people may have come from some of the Near Eastern or North African stock, such as the Egyptians. Then there are many records and reports concerning uh, the explorations of the Norse people, the Vikings at the north, who certainly came over to this continent. Plutarch, in his study of the voyages of the ancient Greeks, uh, measured carefully the time and distance symbols of Greek chronology and decided that there was no doubt that navigation from Greece did reach the actual continent of America at a comparatively early date. Plato, of course, in his discussion of the uh, submergence of Atlantis, uh, points out, as he says, that after that, that continent was destroyed, navigation to the west ceased. If it ceased, it might well have existed before that. Or records or traditions as brought by Solon from Egypt would indicate that there was definite exploration and colonization in the Western Hemisphere. We know that the Chaldeans and Phoenicians traded copper and uh, metals with the peoples of Western Europe and the British Isles. There is no doubt that they could have made a similar passing over to the Western Hemisphere. We know that the idea that it was an unknown area, completely forgotten or ignored up to the time of Columbus, simply is not true. In fact, uh, if you may have seen the recent film on Columbus, there are a few fragments of it that are authentic, not all, however. <laughs> uh, but one of the points that I think is interesting is to realize that uh, actually Columbus was impelled or inspired to his voyage, not by the friendliness of the European powers, but by the fact that he was trying to demonstrate and prove the lost continent theory of Plato. Uh, it's now rather well guessed and probably true that Christopher Columbus, of whom no likeness is known to have survived, was actually a Greek navigator by the name of Nipsilantes, that he traveled on ships following Greek traditions, according to the records of Plutarch and Plato, that he found a Western world 
there can be no doubt. But of course, his landfall never reached the actual uh, continent of America. Actually, also, other explorations and other types of study have brought in all kinds of modifying uh, opinions about the American Indian group. We divide that group largely into the North American, Central American, and South American cultures. Because of the uh, availability of certain records and the limitation of time, we have to summarize some of this material in rather briefly to arrive at our principal subject. In the first place, uh, there is much evidence that the uh, cosmogony of the North American Indian group and for that matter, the Central American, this cosmogony is almost exactly Phoenician. In other words, it has to do with the divisions of the universe, as these divisions were recognized in Europe and Asia very much earlier than any exploration in the Western Hemisphere. The uh, universe of the American Indian was divided roughly into three sections, or three parts, we have to also remember that we are dealing with a polyglot group of tribes, each one with a little different tradition, each one more or less specialized and isolated by their way of life. But at the same time, generally speaking, we find the, the triple phase of universal structure present in nearly all of the groups, as is pointed out very clearly by Schoolcraft, who is the principal earlier authority on the American Indians in the, in the United States area. The three parts of the universe of the Phoenicians and later of the Indians were, or rather consisted of the three divisions of the world. The first and highest division was heaven. Heaven was a vast expanse. Heaven was the abode of the primordial powers, the forces, the principles, from which all, all other things descended. The second division was the earth, in which the peoples created by the various deities lived out their destinies. And the third division was the underworld. The underworld was not regarded as a purgatorial region but a dark earth from which all mortal things grew or came forth. In the uh, Southwest Indians, a deluge myth exists, and the uh, so chosen tribes were saved by coming up from the underworld on the stalks of corn. Uh, they uh, therefore came, and most mortals were believed to have come from the underworld. This is almost completely Greek and Egyptian because it is assumed definitely in, in, in all classical systems that the material or objective structures of things came out of the earth and were met in a middle distance by the powers of deity descending and the union of heaven and earth produced man. This is the simple statement of it. Of course, it is much more complicated. But in this respect, it was assumed that the three parts of the world were the same in principle as those set forth by Ptolemy of Alexandria, by the Brahmins, by the Lamas of Tibet, by the Buddhists, by the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Persians, and the early Semites. They all had the same basic pattern. Now the question naturally arises, was this pattern uh, transferred from one area to another by travel, migration, exploration, or missionary activity? Or did these divisions arise from the natural internal consciousness of the person or the being itself? This probably cannot be completely solved, but the tr general trend today is to assume definitely that there was a contact between the Western Hemisphere and the sources of European, Near Eastern, and Asiatic cultures. These points are practically all demonstrated firmly in the records that have since come into existence and which are now being studied. Now, if this is the way it goes in general, then we have to consider how a religion develops within a tribal structure. Here we have, for the most part, except in the southwest area, uh, migrant peoples, uh, tribes and groups that travel about 
over a vast area comparatively uninhabited. These groups were isolated into brood families. They were small cultural entities, 10 families, 50 families, 100 families. But they were worlds to themselves, and their entire existence was largely within the small local atmosphere of their own brood group. Now, over the brood group in the Indian philosophy of life, there was always the brood mother, and the descent was very largely on the mother's side, which follows almost precisely the teachings of Egypt. In Egypt, the descent of families was, was measured by uh, the mother's family, and the royal or the line of Egypt descended on the mother's side. So in the brood family, for some unknown reason, they used the same concept as brought the pharaohs of Egypt to their thrones. And yet these were little groups of people wandering around with no real language in common, but bound together by the needs, tribulations, and problems of survival. So we have here uh, the beginning of a tribal life, the tribe being composed of the children of one descent. Therefore, the, the government was parental. It was neither the government of the father nor of the mother, but of the family. And the uh, tribe was a family. It, does not cons it did not consist of a series of individuals, each working out his own destiny as he saw fit. Everyone was related to everyone else, if not physically, at least psychologically. Now, in the pueblos of the Southwest, of course, it became obvious that this uh, parental concept, the one uh, brood family, could result in difficulties, particularly genetic difficulties. Therefore, among the Prevalo peoples, there was always a division. There were always two houses and two parts to the brood family. Both parts were ruled by women, but the two family groups married across the Prevalo. Everyone had to marry a person from the opposite Pueblo. Now, how did they come to this particular conclusion? We do not know but it is part of the ancient tradition that came down from, to them from the olds, from the wise ones, from the good, from the great that had gone before. Uh, because they had no written language, it was inevitable that the Indian would develop the storyteller, the wise man, the sage, the sachem. They were all people who carried forward the tradition by word of mouth. Every young person growing up in an Indian tribe was instructed in the orenda of his people. Orenda was the atmosphere, the psychological realities of things. The tribe was held together not by birth primarily, nor by location, nor by mutual struggle for survival. They were all factors. But the principal factor was the orenda. And the Orenda is a term we have finally gotten into the English language, but it had to come through the German before it got here. The Orenda is actually the mysterious power of the story, the tradition. It was the telling of the glories of the past. It was a way of stimulating in each young person a respect for that which had gone before and a determination to live up to the standards of integrities that came down from the ancestors. Now, this concept of Arenda could be traceable to China, where the same concept was very strong, that each individual was, was responsible for preserving the reputation of his ancestors. This came in some cases to ancestor worship, and there were traces even of this, in some of the tribal rites and ceremonies. But in any event, the orenda was to make you proud of the fact that you belonged to your tribe, that you had job and duty to perform, that it was your need and proper, and proper right that under all conditions you would sacrifice yourself for the common good. Each individual was therefore a defender of his people. And in this sense, the tribes developed 
a certain survival pattern that was useful and helpful. So the old taught the new. The old gave to the young the story of the people, and also the story of the dreams of the people, the hopes, the aspirations. It was also natural, of course, to follow in this situation uh, the uh, policies of the other continents. And one of the great policies of migration and migrant peoples were, was the policy of the masters of the journey. When a caravan left uh, Egypt for the central part of Africa, or when in the, one in the Near East traveled on from Damascus to Antioch, a caravan was a unit of people. A Mobile Indian tribe was also a caravan, always on the way. The um, Plains Indians had to travel to, get, to maintain the source of resource. They had no agriculture to speak of, and they were constantly in search of knee, new ground to leave behind the waste and trash of our previous residences. So the three parts of the tribe, uh, they're very interesting. It is stated in the Bible that when Solomon was to build a temple, he sent to his friend Hiram of Tyre, another king, to join with him. And together they produced or brought together a group of workmen under the leadership of a master artificer. And the great temple was built by these three men working together. Solomon the king, Hiram the king, and Chiram the great artificer. Now in the caravan, as it goes today across the wastes of Asia, the moment a caravan is organized, it becomes mandatory uh, to elect the officers that are to rule the caravan. Because caravans could be attacked by terrible storms, they could be attacked by wicked brigands, they could come into many kinds of evil. And it was necessary for the caravan to have a fully organized structure even before it set out. Maybe there would be 50 or 100 camels or more, but they had to be an organization to carry on the caravan. So they elected the master of the caravan. Who, has, who is the final voice in all things relating to the journey. They also elected the master of the march, who had to do with the protection of the caravan from the dangers and terrors of the way. And the third officer was the master of rest and repose. He was the one that chose the campsite made arrangements for water and food, and did everything that was necessary to protect the caravan through the hours of darkness. These were the three officers that had charge of this important phase of uh, existence. Now, among the Sioux people and among most of the American Indian tribes, every tribe had these three leaders that were appointed that carried on the work of the people they maintained the tribe in its function, and probably the most famous of these was the Sioux uh, uh, Triad, consisting of Chief Gaul, Crazy Horse, and Sitting Bull. The, uh, that particular tribe, the tribe that finally was the undoing of General Custer, that tribe had first the leader of the whole tribe. He was the one who corresponded to King Solomon. Then with him was the master of the, of the march. This was Crazy Horse, the war chief. And the third was the counselor, uh, the um, spiritual head, who reigned or ruled while the caravan was at peace or where the tribe had no outside problems, who was the keeper of the culture and the religion of the people. And this was Sitting Bull. Now... How was a person like Sitting Bull appointed? No one knows just exactly, but from the tribal reports we believe that the medicine priests or the medicine chiefs or the chiefs of repose and rest were born, not made. Every Indian in a tribe was considered with equal care to find out which one was obviously and strangely a mystic 
who possessed some mysterious power, that the orenda had descended upon this person. And very often, every Indian had to do his vigil. And very often, the Indian who did his vigil had the vision of the Thunderbird. And if he had the vision of the Thunderbird, he was a medicine priest. The Thunderbird of the Indian is the phoenix of the rest of the world. Same principles, same concepts, same ideal. And the phoenix in case, in substance, was the symbol of the spiritual government of the group, the race, the nation, or the tribe. Also a very interesting point is, in the American Indian, that Sitting Bull and all the medicine priests dress differently from the other members of the tribe. Every one of the medicine priests wore a costume combining male and female attributes that they had to be distinguished so that in a sense they were represented as androgynous beings. Uh, we realize, of course, that for ages the clergies of nearly all religions have worn robes that were not the same as the secular garments of their people. These robes, with their skirts and flaring headpieces and so forth, were the symbols of the mystical level of humanity, the level in which the heart and the mind, the, the female and the male, were united in eternal union, producing the mystic with his extrasensory perceptions. Now, in the American Indian tribe, there was another point involved in this that was interesting. The Indians, unfortunately, were frequently troubled with the inter-tribal warfare and so forth, and the medicine priests were never in the battle. They remained aloof, and neither side was permitted to injure one of the priests. His garments revealed his station, and he was therefore regarded as equally sacred by two tribes in deadly enmity with each other on every other subject. This was an interesting aspect of religion, which meant a great deal, apparently, uh, to these people. The same concept also survives in Egypt for a long, long time. Having attained the uh, rulership of the tribe, then the problem of the education of the mystic was very important. Now, we know that the traditions of uh, initiation into various rites are common throughout the Near East, the Far East, and North Africa. We also realize that these initiation rites have descended from a remote antiquity. The American Indian had them also. His initiation rites differed with various tribes, but probably the most interesting that we have, carefully preserved by the reports of the Smithsonian Institution, um, is the history ritual of the Medi, a tribe that had a very highly evolved ritualism, which has been compared and was compared in the Smithsonian reports with the accounts of ancient mystery rituals and modern masonry. The immediate initiation was divided into three degrees, presented in a structure with three rooms, representing, as we have noted, the three parts of the universe. Those seeking to become aware of the secrets of the tribe went through various tests and, it, and initiations and obligations and were tried in every way before they were given the leadership of the family of tribes to which they belonged. The media rituals were kept on a birch bark board or trestle board, and several of these trestle boards are in existence, and we have one in our library collection here. These boards represent the, the rooms in which the rites were given. One room was behind the other. There is a similar structure, almost identical, in the Hawaiian Islands, except that the three rooms are one above another instead of one in front and the others behind it. So all over, these things were commonly held, and they, uh, they are very important to our thinking. If, for instance, a young person 
is born into the tribe as a mystic to become a medicine priest. Of course, he must first do vigil. He must go forth and find his place in the larger universe. The Indian realized very much what we know now as a mysticism or a psychism. He went forth alone. He fasted as the prophets of old. He smoked the sachem, he smoked the pipe of the sachem, which was the same as the burning altar of Jerusalem. He put his pair, pair, uh, pair flags on this ground, as the Tibetans do, and he put on these little sticks, the feathers, which were the symbol of the creation of a square lodge or a room, and he sat in the midst of it and prayed and meditated and asked for help to call upon the old and the true and the wise, the ones from the great medicine lodge in the sky who were to come down and tell him what to do and how to live and create with him a contact by which he could ask for their help whenever it was necessary. This ritual system went on until testing, proving, and initiating were confirmed by the tribe as having been successfully experienced by the novice. He was then given the position of a tribal teacher. One, I asked one of them once how he gained his knowledge of healing, for healing was perhaps the most important of all the mystery rites of the American Indians. And he said very simply that he had never been instructed by anyone. The previous medicine priests had not conveyed any information to him. Each one had to find his way of healing for himself. He had to go out and ask, and when sickness came, he had to watch for the omens, watch for the signs, watch for the indications by which the great ones would show him the remedy for the illness at hand. And it usually, it usually so occurred. In one case that came to my attention, he went out, the priest went out to pray in the darkness of the night, and in the midst of his prayers he saw a little spark of light shining at him out of the darkness. And he went over, and it was a little plant growing in the ground, and it had a spark of light had centered in it. And he took that plant, made out of that the herbal tea that brought about the recovery of the patient. The Indian depended on these signs all the time. He depended upon all of the atmosphere around him, all of the air. To him, the world was filled with life and light. Every bit of air was a potential carrier of truths, of wisdoms, of, of mysteries and marvels. The Indians also, like most other peoples, had a world of elementary beings. They had their gnomes and their sylphs and their undines. They had the nature spirits. Among the nature spirits were the water Indians, who came on to the land only on rare intervals, and the cave Indians, who came out only at night. And, High, and Longfellow in his Hiawatha describes a number of these elementary forms that were believed in by the Indians and which appeared to them in dreams and visions. Now, the Indian was not essentially a cruel person, but he was confronted with a situation that was very difficult for him to solve. He had to feed his people. He had no agriculture as we know it. Most of his land would not support a, a great abundance of natural foods. He had to therefore hunt. He had to go out and uh, follow the buffalo herds and gain the food for his people. But the Indian was not a sportsman. He never killed for sport. He never killed to prove that he could. And he took a very deep and mystical and mysterious attitude in connection with hunting for food. When he found that it was necessary for him to kill a buffalo to feed his people, he would sit down very quietly by the side of the slain animal and bring out his pipe of peace and bring out the symbols of meditation and prayer, and he would thank the spirit of that animal. He would explain to that animal that, he, that it knew, as well as he knew, that the people were hungry, that he had not killed for sport, nor had he killed because he disliked the buffalo. He killed because his children had to have food. 
Now, this sounds somewhat as an appeasement, but there is a second line to it that is much more interesting. And because the Indians had a belief that every so many thousands of years, animals and humans exchanged places, and that in some time, in the infinite future, it would happen that he, as the hunter, would be, in turn, the hunted. So he said to the spirit of the buffalo, When the time comes and I am a buffalo, and you are a man, I will give my body as you have given yours. This was a religious conviction and was one of the strange and rather interesting details of Indian thought and life. Now, the Indians also were very much given to uh, solving problems simply and efficiently. They had very simple tribal laws, but in many cases their laws were exceedingly wise. If in a tribe of uh, where Sitting Bull was the medicine priest and the mystical counselor and the paterfamilia of all of these Indians, two young braves got into a quarrel. It was a bitter quarrel, and there was bad word and threat of violence. But no one could go against the medicine priest. So the medicine priest stepped in between them. They didn't dare say anything to him. And he said, dig a hole. So the two did as they were told. They dug a hole about four feet deep in the earth. And he then turned to one and said, Say your hate into the hole. And he said to the other, Say your hate into the hole. Now cover it up and shake hands. <laughs> that was the solution to a delicate problem. And also Sitting Bull was responsible for certain laws concerning the treatment of people. If, as was sometimes the case, the hunting was difficult, and food was not too abundant, even from the herds that were not still undecimated, uh, the Indian finally came back with a kill or food or whatever he could bring. Immediately, the medicine priest took over. In fact, he didn't have to after the first time because it became automatic. He said, you have food. All right. You must not say who you are or what you bring, but each of you in secret will take a piece of that food and place it at the entrance to the wigwam of every widow and every child. They eat first. If there's not enough, the brave man does not eat at all. If there is enough, that, yeah, the old and the, and the young must come first. The sick must also be considered, and only what is left shall be divided equally among all the rest. No one shall have more than another. No one shall have less than another. This was the law of the tribe. Now, this type of law, of course, would be a little difficult for us to understand, perhaps, but there is something in it that seems to belong strangely to America and perhaps has something we could learn from these elders that went before. Now, along the Atlantic seaboard, there was the most highly evolved group of Indians, probably, on the North American continent. And they formed together the Great League of the Iroquois, the Iroquois of the six nations and of the seven, the Great League of Peace. And this league consisted of what was called the Long House, and it said in law, now here you're Indian, he couldn't read or write, but he said the earth is one long house. Everybody on it is one family. Everyone on it lives in the same house, which is the place we live. And everyone is responsible to keep the peace. This is final. Now the house, the long house, was developed by an Indian mystic, Dagadawida. And he was, like the, the Jewish patri patriarch, slow of speech. And he found another Indian who was later to become the Hiawatha of, Lowen, of Longfellow's poem, who was to be his spokesman. And he was the one who carried the doctrine of the Long House to the people of the, se of the Six Nations, later Seven Nations. And the long house was where they spread the white cloth of the peace. And it was a kind of congress or senate. Each tribe or division of the house of the 
of the uh, long house. Each had its own representative called a sachem. We call them, would call them a senator. They were the lawmakers, and they gathered at regular times uh, to make the laws of the tribe. And it's interesting to note that the women of the tribe did not attend these meetings and did not participate in the legislative procedure, but they, and they alone, voted for and selected the senators. The, no one could occupy a position of authority in the, in the Great League unless he was elected by women. The second thing that is interesting about this particular point, certainly, and one that uh, uh, needs perhaps more consideration than we've given it, and that is that the women of the tribe also in, implied and demanded a certain rule of the League of the, of the Nations. That is, no senator could vote for anything relating to his own tribe. Every one of the senators could vote on everyone's tribe except his own because it was it decided that there should be no way in which he could vote a special advantage to his own people. This is something that, you know, might sometime have a thought for the future. You know, no. <laughs> it has a point or two. Now, when the Xachim had met in tribal Congress, uh, the time came for the great meeting. The word was spoken. The door is open. The door is open meant that everyone could have his say. But, however, there must never be any unkind language. Never should one candidate or one senator rebuke another. No one should tell what was wrong with the other. He should tell what was right with what he thought was necessary. He should not say, I am wiser, I am brighter, I am better informed than the others. He should say, this is what I propose. Everyone can have their own say. And when it was all finished and uh, it was decided what was going to happen, then the door was closed again and they, uh, these senators went back to their normal tribal responsibilities. A group of these were sent to England at one time in the early days while the tribe was of the League of Nations was still very powerful and presented at court and they made a tremendous impression. They arrived in full feathers with all their bearskins and their moccasins and their beadwork and the reports of the English government at that time said that they were the most solemnly honorable people they had ever seen. That they were there for a purpose and they did the purpose for which they were appointed. Now the tribe went along and gra gradually involved some other members and was gradually becoming a very powerful instrument. It still exists in, in certain parts of Canada as a tribal rule or a tribal law or procedure. One of the most interesting points perhaps in connection with this was the relationship between the Great League and William Penn. Now, William Penn was a one of the uh, white people whom the Indians learned to really like. And uh, they uh, admired him on the ground that they knew he would never break his word, that he always kept his promise, and he was always fair to them. When Penn came to the uh, United States, he brought with him a grant of land from the King of England. The King of England charged Penn's family and those settlers that went with him a very tidy sum for this grant. So, uh, when he left, he told the king, he had an audience with the king, told the king he was uh, going to make arrangements to purchase this land from the Indians. And the king said, but you've already bought it from me, and I think you paid a pretty good price for it. And Penn said, I'm sorry, sire, uh, I can't take it that way, because you had no right to sell it to me. It belonged to the Indians, and I'm paying them for it. This is what they liked about him among the Indians. <laughs> also, the tribe developed what was called the Peace Belt, possibly the first passport that we know of. The Peace Belt was made either of shell wampum or bead wampum. And the great Peace Belt of Penn is in, exhi in exhibition until Philadelphia now. 
But this peace belt enabled a member of the tribes to travel anywhere among all most distant and warlike peoples. And if he carried the peace belt, he was in say, absolutely safe. No one would do anything to injure him. Because one of the things these people did have that was very important was they had a certain integrity of spirit that was not easily affected by changing circumstances. All of which now brings us to one of the keynote situations of the whole matter. Uh, what is the way in which we can best define the way of the Indian religion? First of all, we must assume that it is a natural religion, a religion that comes from observation and reflection and not from indoctrination. The Indian lives close to nature, and like most primitive people, even now, they had, the Indians had a very deep, mysterious communion with the earth. They came so close to dependency upon it that they gained a great respect for nature. They respected all life, every living thing. They respected and believed in life, and they believed that all creatures, great and small, had souls just as much as they had. That everything was alive, everything was divine in its substance and essence, and regardless of circumstances, must always be treated with respect and decency. That we learn mostly by quietly contemplating the realities of life. In the Southwest, there's no doubt in the world that the sand paintings and the great chants of the Ibachai are mandalas, that they are meditation symbols. They were created especially for a purpose, most of them, and that purpose was healing. But the actual symbol itself, if you go to one trant a reservation today and one of the surviving medicine priests makes a sand painting, and you go to another reservation 200 miles away and have this, another painter do the same subject. These men have never met each other. They've had no contact of any kind, but there will not be the slightest difference between the two pictures. These pictures come down from a traditional background. They have carried in the mind for ages. They are part of the orenda. They are part of the way in which the Indian, not having a written language, makes pictures of the realities of his own existence. Pictures for the contemplation of life. These pictures have meanings for others, but a special meaning for himself. For he's actually drawing a picture of his own inner life, of the part of himself which belongs to the great world around and above. Part of himself which belongs to the great world around and above. This type of picture, therefore, is a meditation device or symbol. The Indian's final contact with life is the voices. Now these we would term psychic impressions. We would assume perhaps that the olds and the trues, the ancestral spirits, might come and speak to him. He believed that they did. But there is a certain difference between the psychism of the American Indian and the psychic phenomena of our modern civilization. Uh, the difference is in the situation and in the values involved. The American Indian had no preconceptions of life. He had nothing within himself to fight the realities which he desired to experience. He had not been indoctrinated with all kinds of beliefs. He had not developed intense neuroses of one kind or another. He had not so complicated his own inner life that when he was perfectly quiet, the thing that came through was a babble of voices. He was completely simple in himself. He expected to live and die in the position he occupied. He had no thought of wealth, no desire for authority. He had no concept 
of the complication of his life or of his civilization. He lived out his years as a sm part of a small tribal unit dedicated to co cooperation. Now, it would naturally follow that such a person, becoming very quiet, would be able to open a door inward, a door that would not open into a pandemonium of doubts, fears, and anxieties, but into a very simple type of thing which would almost the into inner world of a small child. The Indian was, intellectually speaking, a small child, but had the tremendous integrity of childhood which had not been spoiled, which had not been gradually tutored out of existence by the sophistication of a complicated civilization or lack of it. Therefore, the Indian psychism was very seldom dangerous. It very seldom led the wrong way. It very seldom impelled him to deeds that were not worthy. It did not give him any fanaticism. He did not become intolerant religiously. He did not become so immersed in some kind of a belief that he was unable to fulfill his common duties in tribal life, nor was he inclined to try to go on every day trying to reform tribal life. He didn't want the tribal life to change. That would change which was according to the power of heaven. The tribal destiny was in the keeping of the medicine priest, and the medicine priest in turn went forth into the wilderness to pray for guidance. There was no sense of the tremendous competition of intellects among these people that we find in our modern world today. And the very simplicity of their lives contributed very greatly uh, to the integrity of their psychic inner impressions. They nearly always came to the fact, the reality of a matter, was almost intuitively and instinctively recognized. There was no need to cut through all kinds of false beliefs. There was no need for elaborate intellection on these subjects. It was to be still and very quiet and ask that which never fails, the tremendous integrity of existence itself. Now the Indian also had certain attitudes concerning death. Of course, the American Indian never had the kind of fear uh, that comes to those who have been indoctrinated on the subject. The, uh, to the average Indian, life and death were aspects of one thing. The Indian, when the time came to go, went as he had lived, quietly and at peace with himself and the world. He did not have a descendants to fight over his estate. There wasn't any. He had no wayward children to leave out of his will because waywardness was unknown in tribal life. Therefore, in a very simple way, he went forth as he lived. One thing, however, that every Indian, of some of the tribes at least, had was his death song. He had a song that was given to him usually by the spirits, by the manadus, by the great ones. And when the time came for him to go forth, he went forth in glory. Uh, cases where Indians in uh, battle with white or soldiers and so forth stood up with a bullet in their hearts and sang their death song before they fell dead. The death song was the triumph of life over everything else. The triumph of truth over error. The statement of perfect confidence in going forth into the great world of reality. This was a very simple, but it's a tremendously powerful instrument in connection with Indian thinking. It was the fact that the Indian lived without fear and died without fear, because he knew perfectly well in his own heart of hearts that he was part of something that was eternally good, that everything was right, and therefore that there was no cause for fear. Fear came from false beliefs. While well, you stayed with the truth, uh, you would find the universe was good. Also, another interesting point comes in. I brought up from the uh, Navajo Reservation, Hastin Kla, one of the great medicine priests of the uh, Navajo Nation. He is the one who was commemorated in Santa Fe by the Museum of American Indian Ceremonial Art. 
He was one of the last of the great painters and the great weaver. And today his name is cherished throughout the areas of New Mexico and Arizona as one of the greatest of his people. When he was here, a number of interesting things happened. One was that I showed him a picture we had at that time. He spoke no English. We had to use a young Navajo by the name of Haskanaswid as his interpreter. But I showed him a picture of an old Chaldean inscription. He looked at it, grunted a little bit. He was an elderly man, over six feet. He looked at it and he told the other young Indian, he said, my ancestors could read that. He said, I can't, but they could. In other words, the hint there seemed to be that everything that we showed him that had to do with uh, uh, ancient cultures of Egypt and so, so was subconsciously familiar to him. Somewhere he had gotten it from the Oranda. His ancestors had told him in voice, either in life or beyond the grave. But he believed definitely that he had seen, or his ancestors had seen, writing of this kind. And it's probably quite true, because there was a very definite tie somewhere to the old world. This tie is emphasized by Lord Kingsborough, who was one of the first great students of Central American civilization, and also by La Plongeon in his studies of the Maya peoples. Uh, and Lummis, uh, who lived very long in the near southwest, in one of his books goes into a study of American Indian magic, as this is paralleling that of India. And this was a very interesting thing. Of course, as Lummis pointed out, the Indian couldn't grow a mango tree because he didn't have any mango trees to grow. But he took a kernel of corn and put it in the earth, in the kiva, and chanted, and went through the rituals. And the corn stalk grew and bulk fresh corn ears within an hour. Magic, the same principle, but a different instrument. One after another, these Indian doctrines seemingly can be traced back to primordial or natural magic, the power of the mind over circumstances of existence, but always with trained minds, always with individuals who have become uh, enlightened in the mysteries of the true way. Many of the um, potteries of Southwest U.S., also have the famous labyrinth design associated with Crete. Here the little man is wandering through a mystic maze. The mystic maze is again another symbol for the house of initiation uh, through which the individual while going along crooked paths often ending in blind alleys must finally find his way to the one straight road that leads home. This was the, the basic uh, sign or symbol behind this entire concept. The Indian, when he was uh, dying, if he was a good man, the old master, the uh, priest, the medicine priest, would go with him into the other life and accompany him to the great lodge in the sky where he would sit with his ancestors in the presence of the Manados the great spiritual leaders of the world. And uh, the description of this particular procedure is almost identical with that of the ancient Irish Druids. In Ireland, the folklore is the same thing. The mystic or magician could go with the soul of the dead into the other life. There was no inferno or punishment. Each one would, would have been himself. And because he had been himself and because he had lived among good people and had been a good people uh, symbol, he went on to a better life. Uh, the, um, some of the Indian tribes, as Schoolcraft also points out, believed in reincarnation. They believed that they did come back, not only later and possibly in the animal likeness, but come back as human beings and that the soul itself, free of body, traveled all around the world. But of course the world to the Indian was his own reservation, but to him it was large enough. The Indian also, in his own inner life, uh, had a situation which I think many people would probably benefit by understanding. 
The uh, Indians used a limited amount of tobacco and also a limited amount of mild narcotic material for their religious purposes, never for any other reason. They used it to become a symbol of something perhaps for the inducement of trances. Actually, those who did it in those days and even more recently, there is no particular indication that they received uh, adverse consequences or were, became habitual users or came into a dangerous psychological condition. The reason being that they had no psychological condition before they started. The ritual was simply that they were to t do something to sensitize themselves. In Greece, the same thing was done. In the Roman mysteries, it was done. It was done all through the Near East and Far East, that certain herbs and so forth were called herbs of vision. They helped the individual to see, and they also were the ancient substitute for what we would call anesthesia. For the ancients had definitely anesthetic drugs or materials to ease pain. But because there was no contact with the complicated life of a competitive civilization, the individual, if he did have a vision or a dream, should seldom if ever have a nightmare because there was nothing to worry him, nothing to frighten him. Everything was right. Now, that didn't mean that all the things that were happening around him were, were pleasant, but they were necessary. They were all accepted without re resentment, without pressure. The Indian life way would not permit hatred. Therefore, the dreams would not come through with hate symbolism. The individual who had become part of the tribal life uh, found that it was quite possible for him to uh, become slightly entranced and receive a vision or a message that was of great value to his people. But it never caused him to want to do it again soon, or maybe never again. But it was, it was a fact that if he himself had no guile in him, the setting up of habits, like narcotic habits, which take hold of the individual who has never taken hold of himself. The uh, moment the person co closes his door to his own weakness and builds strength, he escapes from all of these complications. But as long as he lives in a world of the gratification of his appetites, he will suffer, and all forms of vision, psychic phenomena, narcotics, and everything of this kind will turn on him with viciousness. It's because he himself is not basically clean. Clean of tensions and stresses. Clean of all the things that cause great trouble to the average person. It's interesting also to note that in the Southwest region, uh, there's several very famous old medicine priests, and a great many of the Anglo, that is the non-Indian, -Mex non non-Mexicans, living in the area, would like to use those fellows for their doctors. They didn't have too much faith in the local medic, and they would have been delighted. But the Indians won't take them because of the complications involved with the American Medical Association. But occasionally someone sneaks through anyway, but it's very rare. But those who have had such experiences have been very much amazed at the constructive results as the Smithsonian and the American uh, Bureau of Ethnology reports also includes some discussion of the uh, uh, snake dance phenomena of the Southwest. Uh, this phenomena uh, has been variously interpreted. Uh, one group, of course, that doesn't believe in anything particularly, says that they are harmless snakes. The other group says in some way this poison has been taken out of them, and uh, a third group it just doesn't know anything about it anyway. But uh, in these ceremonies, uh, the, 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 uh, those who attend, non-Indians, are warned to keep away far enough so that there is no danger of becoming involved with these snakes because they're not pleasant people sometimes. And uh, on one occasion it is known, someone stepped too close, and as the Indian came by with the snake, held between his teeth, 
the snake bit the, the white man. Well, there was a moment of very great consternation. The dance was temporarily suspended, and an Indian came forward and said to this man, if you will give us your word of honor that you will never tell what we do, we'll fix it so you're all right. So he agreed, and they took him down into the kiva and performed the snake ritual for him. He would never tell what happened, but in an hour or two came out perfectly well. They knew how to do it. Something that you don't see that is quite as fantastic as that, of course. Uh, I saw one of the Gallup festivals years ago, while well, it was still functioning in full force, and that's the feather dance. And the feather dance, and a group of Indians form a circle and place a, a fairly large woven basket in the center of the circle. And in this, they stand a highly decorated eagle's feather that has been enlarged and it has little flangs and tips and tassels hung on it uh, in this basket. Uh, they then sit in a circle around it and start chanting. And after a certain length of time, no one is within 10 or 15 feet of the basket, the, the, the feather begins to agitate. And in a few minutes, it rises six or eight inches out of the basket and remains in the air for several minutes and then slowly settles back. Uh, I think one of the reasons, perhaps, why they've discontinued these ceremonies is because they annoy people. No one wants to believe these things these days. <laughs> they want to believe that it's all one great mistake and that it's due to the fact that these poor benighted souls are not wise enough or good enough to realize that materialism is the answer to everything. <clears throat> In any event, however, that walking with the Indians, you find a great many of these interesting and remarkable circumstances arising. I was at, uh, attended a graduation service at the American Indian School in New Mexico uh, in, the, in the middle 40s. Uh, this uh, was a graduation class for young Indians who had finished what would be equivalent to us as high school. In other words, they uh, were speaking English, they had taken their examination with the three R's and all this type of thing, and uh, uh, were very nice boys and girls. They were uh, typical of a graduation exercise. They all lined up all together on the stage, and the teachers were all there. And, but most of all, the relatives were all there. And that's what really made the situation tremendous. Out from the reservation came all these mysterious-looking people, wrapped in blankets and hoods, wearing many types of jewelry, which were very beautiful jewelries, but uh, very stoical with their long braided hair and their, all their native regalia. And the special section in front had been set aside for the happy and exalted relatives who were all there to see their children or their neighbor's children graduate from school. And it was a very impressive service. The diplomas were given out with great uh, uh, gusto, and uh, uh, the parents were beaming from ear to ear. They didn't clap because that was something they hadn't learned to do yet, but they were very pleased about the whole thing. And finally, at the end, the class valedictorian got up and made the speech. And the speech was the wonders of living in America. And it built up to a very great note in which these Indian children bestowed upon the America in general all of the virtues of their own tribe. They were so fond of the wonderful friendliness, the wonderful kindness, the wonderful peace, and all this type of thing the, 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 the parents were all nodding enthusiastically in Navajo, but the audience at the back, was, uh, made up of the Anglos, looked a little sheepish. <laughs> but this is the way it is and was there. Uh, these people have a very wonderful and very sincere situation involving them at all times in everything that they do. We know several uh, Indians who have gone quite far in their own tribal life and most of them were very sad because there was no one to carry on. This was perhaps especially true here in the California Indian group. It was then here in outside of Riverside that I saw the Indians perform the fire walking ceremony. 
which uh, uh, is, was forbidden. Uh, the Indian school at that time, that was many years ago, the school at that time had its own police composed of Indians. And these policemen were supposed to prevent any of these ceremonies from being performed. But the policemen joined in the conspiracy, and before it was over, they too were walking across the bed of coals. <laughs> but down the back of Riverside, in a ranch of a kindly um, Anglo, the old ceremonies were carried on for years. Well, everywhere you find the Indian, you find something of a mystical nature. But you try to understand him and what he stands for, you realize that the great secret of what he has is that he has, has not yet been spoiled. Many efforts have been made to do it. Everyone has tried desperately to get the Indian out of his own life way. But he has sort of clung to it. And even if the surface has been mutilated in one way or another, the depths have remained comparatively calm. He simply has a concept of life that enables him to be a natural mystic. He can, without any particular effort, do that which most psychics will spend years trying to cultivate, the ability to pierce through into an inner communion with self. This communion is based largely upon natural law. For if you go inside of the individual deep enough, you're going to find reality. The inside of the person may not support his outside in all cases, because his outside is apt to be very seriously con con damaged or contaminated by his worldly situations. But in the inner part of his own life, he lives a very simple, honorable, clean life. And he has a secret tradition about how these things should be done. A few years ago, as after the um, revolution in China, uh, the communist revolution, a group of Tibetans came to this country and went down to New Mexico to see what Indians looked like. When they got there, they thought they were looking in a mirror because these Indians looked exactly like themselves. The same turquoise jewelry, the same clothes, the same hair, the same facial features, and they would might just as well have been looking at each other, which had a quite a factor in assuming or helping to assume that there certainly was an Asiatic contact there and uh, probably had at a very ancient time a bit of migration from the mainland. The migrations are referred to in ancient literature in Tibet and China, particularly in China, but the uh, proofs have never been adequate. Also, the missionaries coming in down in there having their little difficulties, but for the most part, the missionaries in the in close to the Indian tribes have been a pretty fairly spare people. Uh, they uh, uh, one told me a missionary who had spent 20 years there had a little church on one of the pueblos. And uh, uh, he said, uh, you see, they come to, to, to worship in the little church uh, every Sunday morning, and then they go out back and perform all their own rituals. It never has interfered with anything. It's like the Chinese. If one religion is good, two is better. <laughs> the more religions you have, the better chance you have of getting there. <laughs> so they're very nice. Well, I said to this old man, he's an old priest, I said, what do you do when they do these rituals? Do you join? Well, he said, I don't say I join, but something tells me that I got to get someplace on the other side of the reservation and take care of a little private business. He's never interfered with them. And um, actually, as he told me seriously, he says, at some point so close to our own, we wouldn't know where to start interfering. The native religions of these people are, for the most part, very good basic religions, very very, very fine uh, examples of integrities. Actually, the um, universe, therefore, consists of these three worlds. And in man, these three worlds are the three parts of himself. Body, mind, soul. These are all aligned to their own realms. Each of these belongs to itself. <coughs> the body is part of a great plan. The body is part of the world in which it exists. It lives in the world, it lives in, by keeping the laws of the world. 
<coughs> and it continues for its appointed time. Within the body is the mind, and it is the mind that guides the body and makes possible that the body shall become improved. The mind helps to protect the body. It guards it against evils that might otherwise destroy it. And the instruments of the mind are the sensory perceptions by means of which man is warned of danger or given various ways of improving his life. The other part, the spiritual part, is very secret, very mysterious. It is not symbolized too much, but the great leader of this particular phase of existence is the Manado. The Manado is the great one, the eternal one. The Manado is the one who has his throne upon the North Pole, usually, or somewhere in its equivalent, on the top of one of the mountains of the reservations, apparently. But the Manado is the father of all that lives. And the father of all that lives has two message, messengers, the phoenix and the serpent. The phoenix bird carries the messages of the Manado to the mind of man and to nature. The serpent is the great earth principle which bears witness and sends up its messages to the mind. Therefore, the outer life is protected by the serpent. The higher life is protected by the phoenix, or the um, sacred bird. This uh, bird, of course, is definitely the same thing as the phoenix of our own philosophies. And incidentally, originally, the eagle on the great seal of the United States was a phoenix bird. Therefore, the bird of divinity, the bird of transformation, the bird of regeneration, the bird of immortality, was not only part of the belief of the Indians, but in some way, maybe through Ben Franklin, who had a mind for those things, uh, brought into the seal of the United States. Therefore, the seal stands as a phoenix symbol of regeneration, restoration, renovation, and transformation to rise from the darkness of ignorance to the light of reality. This, the uh, Indians also had sacred places all around through their various reservations and resources. Sometimes in the old days, the Plains Indians just wandered from one place to another. But they also had their laws and their ways and their wisdoms. And uh, everything depended upon the constant vigilance of the individual. Uh, the Indian, I talked to some Indians who are now part of our way of life. And they point out very carefully, that it's very certain, they said, there's something very necessary. The fact that this is a great country with a tremendous complication of life and a tremendous opportunity to grow and to serve and to help, that uh, there has to be some form of discipline. The discipline to keep the values, keep the integrities. With the loss of the discipline, the tribe on the, in the desert or in the wilderness would soon disappear. For lack of discipline, every empire the world has ever built has failed because the individual gradually became self-seeking, gradually became determined to use his world to attain his own private purposes. The Indian is protected against this because his world was not in, oriented so that private purposes could mean much. But in the large civilization, there has to be a transformation. We have to learn what the Indian learned when he fed the old and the young first. We have to learn of a great responsibility. And Confucius gave us a very great key to this, that a surviving civilization has to have its integrities. Now, how do we get these integrities? Can we pass laws for them? We can, but the laws will be broken in a moment. If uh, we are out to find leaders, can the leader lead the rest? Very unlikely. The great tragedy of leadership is always the same. Helping people, as uh, Shaw pointed out, is the world's most dangerous occupation. <laughs> so what happens? The, the discipline has to come from within. 
Now to come from within it must come as a mystical experience or as Oranda. Our public school system would be a perfect place for a lot of Oranda because it could give us the realization of the tremendous amount of, the, of reality that has gone into the creation of civilization. The heroes who have never been sung, the martyrs who have died that the future could be better, the spreading of ideals and integrities. Every one of these integrities, as is shown in some of the Indian drawings, is attended by a stumble. The individual cannot go directly from here to eternity without delays, without interferences, without mistakes, without shortcomings of his own. But the general direction of the road must be straight. And that straight road must lead not to some mysterious building somewhere. It must lead to the sky. It must lead to the lodge of the great ones, which is heaven itself. Everything depends on keeping the rules. Everything depends upon disciplining the self keeping away from the entanglements which destroy the integrities of character. And as the American Indian game came into the ways of the non-Indians in this country, we began to see that many of his values are slowly fading. Against this, however, there is a rising spirit among the Indians to make their contribution to the world that has not been very thoughtful of them. And there is today a great feeling upon, among many Indian groups and individuals that they have a tremendous contribution to make to the future of our civilization. That the time has come when the simple, homely values must come back, must be recognized as the supreme values of life. That instead of continuing to build one mistake upon another, we must finally find the straight road that leads in. Now this road is in everyone. There's no possibility of our not having this path in ourselves. This is the great path of the rainbow goddess. This is the marvelous reality that encloses all parts of the great diagram of life. But we have to be capable of internal exp expression of this. We must learn to remove the whole mass of false attitudes which have become natural to us. We have become not necessarily the victims of our bad habits alone. We have become victims of the entire lack of true insight. We have forgotten that heaven leads and earth must follow, which was the great secret of Taoism. We have forgotten that the power of eternal value must become the leader of life. That somewhere there are laws that are immutable. These are in the great sky lodge of the eternal spirits. These laws must be kept. They cannot be forced upon us by the gods because the laws are meaningless to us unless we voluntarily accept them. We must make the decisions, not heaven. But if we are wise, we will make the decisions along the straight road that leads back to the stars from which we came. If we can do this, then we can follow the Indian light way. We can follow the idea that they would give us now out of their gradual restoration and reformation. They have gone through the great mistakes that we forced upon them. They have gone through the great errors of personal ambition and all this type of thing. But now they are beginning to realize that the whole answer lies in the purification of their own tradition. That they must find their own life way again. And then if they can help us in any way, it is to help us to find our life way. Not necessarily identical with theirs, but a life way that is identical with our own necessity, identical with the mysterious and wonderful constitution which we have been given. We have a destiny, as every creature has a destiny. And if we will find the destiny, we can survive and grow. 
but the only way to find it is to go in. Go along the old path that leads in to the quietude of a self which we have freed for this purpose. The mind can give us the quietude, the understanding and the insight that we can enter into a state of knowing. And in the peace of a peaceful mind guarding our actions and our thoughts, we can then understand the uh, true secret of the constant presence of the gods. Uh, the Indian knows that these spirits are everywhere. We kind of think they are. We still pray to them as though they were everywhere. But they know they are everywhere. And the truth is no further from us than it is on the side of the mountain with four prayer plumes and the pipe of peace. That sitting quietly in meditation, we will discover that the eternal is with us, within us, and around us at all times. But we cannot find that which is superior to ourselves while we are satisfied to remain inferior. If we are not in desire of improvement, then we can't get better. But if we desire, we don't have to search. No complicated code or creed is necessary. It is to simply allow the beauty of life, the beauty of eternal truth, and the beauty of everlasting integrity to be what it is, what it has always been, and what we have to search for by giving up the mistakes of our daily conduct. Well, that's all for this morning.